Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture number 20. Today we talk about wind power. Wind power is a very old technology similar to hydropower and it started with, for example, sailing boats because also they use wind power. And of course, all of you know windmills from the old days. Here you see a picture of Laubach, a small town close to Gießen, and you see the windmill on the hill over there. This windmill, of course, does not exist anymore, but there's an example of a windmill close to Gießen as well in the Hessen Park, if you want to see one. And it's really interesting to see all the mechanics inside. So in the old days, windmills have been used for milling flour or for pumping water or for, for doing some hammering mechanical work. And they have been very common before steam engines, so fossil fuels arrived. Nowadays, wind power is not so common anymore and people don't like it so much anymore. There are a lot of people who actually really hate wind power. So especially if you have a lot of them, it's called a wind farm, like in this example here. And people say it's really very ugly. Yeah, it destroys landscape and it looks ugly and you should not do that. But also in the old days, there were people fighting against these windmills, like this guy here on the horse. And they afterwards became very famous and there are even theaters and operas about this Don Quixote who fighted against wind power. Many people say they are disturbed by this wind power, not only because it's awful for the landscape, but especially as these white things are moving. You see here how ugly these white things, all the clouds in Scotland are. They disturb the blue of the sky and they really disturb you from your inner peace, which you have normally if you go through a landscape. Another argument against wind power is that all the birds are killed. Also here I have a bit of problem to understand this argument. Because if you look at our roads, all the road kill, and there it's not only birds which are killed, but all kind of animals. So if you especially think about birds, this big bird here, which is common in our area, also has not a very pleasant life in our environment because of all the plastic in this case here. Yeah? And concerning killing birds, it's clear the killer number one are cats. People estimated that about 1 million birds are killed by cats and not a year, but every day. And these cats also kill endangered species. So one has to think about how to relate one's argument to the other side of reality. Another argument against wind power is infrasound. So subsonic noise, which comes from the rotation and the gears in the wind power stations. And people say they get sick from hearing that, or not actually from hearing it because you can't hear it, but the body feels it. And I think all these emotions have to be taken very seriously because it's well known in medicine that it doesn't matter so much how the reality is, it matters what you think about something. In medicine, it's called the placebo effect. So if people, are confronted with something that they believe it's good for them, then they feel better and they also will get better. And if they are confronted with something which they think is bad for them, they will feel worse, but actually they might also get sick from it. So you have to take all those things seriously. Let me take one example about subsonic noise, which I experienced many years ago. At that time, I was living in Hamburg and there was an incineration plant in Hamburg for waste treatment. So the waste was burned there. And you see this chimney there. And this plant produces subsonic noise. If you are in a town, by the way, it's full of infrasound because every car, every lorry produces infrasound. So you don't hear it, but of course you can imagine it's not only the real sound, it's also infrasound coming out there. So what about this incineration plant? I was not only living close to that, I was also working in this area. Actually, at that time, I was working at DAISY, a research center for subatomic particles. And we were about two kilometers away from this plant in about 20 meter depth underground. And we were doing a very sensitive experiment there with lasers. And this experiment had problems. The laser was shaking all the time and we didn't understand what the reason for that was. 
And at some point, we got the solution. In this incineration plant, they had some machines which were working every now and then. And each time when these were working, two kilometers away, underground, our experiment started to shake. Nobody really cared about that. Nobody felt it. Nobody knew about it. But our experiment was so sensitive that it didn't work while this machine was running. So this example tells you that if you don't know about something, it might affect you or might not affect you. But if somebody tells you there's some infrasound coming, which is bad for your health, this will really have an effect on you. And this has to be taken seriously. So in the contrary, what could one do, for example, what would happen if somebody tells you in a convincing way that wind power stations are good for your health? Imagine he says that there's so much infrasound in all our environment. Every car produces it. Every lorry produces it. But these wind power stations have a special infrasound, which is very regular. And this is very good for your health. It heals the chaotic infrasound, which you have normally in your town. Then I'm sure that there are quite a few people who would go close to these wind power stations, sit in front of them and stay in the vicinity of these generators who have this healing power due to their very constant and very homogeneous sound in very low frequencies, which are just the frequencies which can heal you from all this chaos in towns. Okay, so don't take it too seriously, what I told you just now, but I want to emphasize the psychological component of all these discussions on wind power for and against it. And there are many people who exaggerate the dangers of wind power stations. It's clear that nobody puts a wind power station into the landscape just for fun. But the question is, if we want to have energy in our society, how to do it? And for people like me, wind and solar power are the options which have less bad effect on the environment, on the biodiversity and on the health of, of the people. And if you have a different opinion, you should really argue with physics arguments and not just by feeling. It has been shown that it helps a lot if people are involved in the planning of wind power and also if they financially profit from it. This can help to change the opinion of people who oppose wind power currently. But now let's go back to physics. So already in lecture 17, I showed you the wind power potential. So remember this map of our Earth here. We have learned that the wind is especially strong offshore and in the coastal areas and also on mountains. And geographically, the distribution of wind power intensity is very different in the different areas. What is the reason for that? Well, the reason is that wind power finally is solar power. So the sun heats up the air, the atmosphere. Then there are complex motions of the air. And if air is moving, of course, this is what we call wind. And if you look at the globe here, you see how complicated these motions are. Basically, what happens is that in the equator area, wind gets warm and goes up because warm gas goes up. And then when it goes up, it cools down and it moves to the north and the south. So there are circulations around the globe in all kinds of directions. In addition, the Earth is rotating and this rotation of the Earth produces additional forces. These are the so-called Coriolis forces. And the Coriolis forces make the wind turn to the right on the north half of the globe and turn the wind to the left on the south part of the globe. You can see that if you look at the arrows here on this picture. So it's a combination of horizontal motion and vertical motion. If the wind becomes too strong, you easily get the cyclones. And the other point you find is that there are areas where there's a lot of wind and there's less wind. So the areas where there's a lot of wind are mainly the antitrades or westerlies in the north and as well as in the south part of the globe. And in addition, there are the trade winds, which the sailing boats were also using a lot when they traveled to 
from Europe to America, for example. So this is a very complex picture. And of course, you don't have to know all that by heart. But what you should remember is that depending where you are on the globe, you have very different wind conditions. And then, of course, I take my sustainability argument again. If you build a wind power station, you use a lot of material. So to be sustainable, you should try to use as little material as possible. So if you can place your wind power station to an area where there's a lot of wind, you gain more energy with less material compared to bringing the wind power station to an area where there's very little wind. In the old days, of course, people did not have the possibilities to say, we don't put our windmill to Gießen, instead we put it to Norway because there's more wind, because you have to transport the energy somehow, which is easy nowadays, but not at these days. But they knew, for example, that on top of the hill, the wind is stronger. That's why they built the windmill on top of the hill and not in the valley. Even though they had to bring up every sack of grain uphill just to produce their flour. So how does the wind depend on the height? Well, there's a diagram here, a measurement which says if you go higher and higher, the wind speed which is plotted on the horizontal axis increases. So you see it increases from about 3 meter per second to about 8 meter per second in this diagram here. So there's a significant increase of the speed of the wind with the height. Now the important thing is that the wind power goes with the third power of the speed. So, for example, if the wind speed is twice as high on top of the mountain, that means the wind power is not only twice as high, but it's two to the third as high. So two times two times two is eight. So it's eight times stronger than in the valley in this case. So it really makes a big effect. Why the wind power is proportional to the speed to the third power is something I would like to explain you. But that takes a little bit longer and therefore I move it to the next lecture. Yeah, so there I will explain you a little bit of the physics behind it. If you look at the production of wind power stations over the years, what do we see there? Well, we see that they are getting bigger and bigger and that the area of their wings get bigger and bigger. The reason for that is that because the higher you are, there's more wind, so there's more wind power. And also, of course, the amount of wind power which a station can produce depends on the area. And what counts is the cross-sectional area of the wheel going around. Now let's talk a little bit about technology. I will also say a few more words in the next lecture about technology. But this is a typical wind power station, how it is done nowadays. So most of them have three blades which are rotating. In the early days, there were many different attempts to produce wind power station. One of the first attempts was this wheel here, which has really a lot of these blades. It's close to the windmills which were used in the US in former times. And it turned out, after studying those things in more detail, that the best technology is to have less blades. You can produce a wind power station even with one blade. You can do it with two or with three or four. But it turns out that just from the cost effectiveness and from the efficiency, three blades seem to be the best solution. These blades also have a certain structure. They have a certain profile as shown here in this picture. All this technology reminds a lot to propellers of planes and actually it's a very similar technology. It's a very similar physics. The propeller has an engine which brings it into a rotation and then the rotation of the propeller produces a lot of wind. And in a wind power station it's just the opposite. There's a lot of wind and the wind rotates the propeller and then there is a generator which produces electricity from the rotation of the propeller. So it's in principle, just the opposite technology and wind power stations, of course, learned a lot from the aerodynamics of propellers. And that's why they look very similar to a propeller nowadays. In the next lecture, I will say a few more words about it. Here just the principles. Below you see a big wind farm onshore close to the coast of the Baltic Sea in the northeast of Germany. 
and on top you see an offshore wind park, Alpha Ventus, which is in the North Sea in Germany and which produces wind power on the sea. Wind power had a boom in the last years. Here on this diagram you see the installed power as a function of the years. So it really goes up rapidly. This boom comes from the fact that wind power is available everywhere on the globe and it's rather cheap nowadays. The big wind power stations are very efficient and the electricity which you get out of it at a good area are cheaper than most of the other sources nowadays. On the right side you see a second plot here. This plot shows you a similar thing. This also shows you that over the year there is more and more power coming out of the wind power station. But this time it's not the installed capacity, but it's the amount of electricity which is produced. If you install a wind power station, even if there's no wind, you have a certain amount of installed wind power, but you don't get electricity from it when there's no wind. But if it is in operation and there's a lot of wind, you have a lot of produced Power. Therefore, always, if you look at these diagrams, you really have to understand what is plotted and this makes a big difference quantitatively. The other problem on these two plots, again, is that they are given in different units. So the left plot is given in gigawatt, the right plot is given in terawatt hours per year. But if you listened to my previous lecture, you know how to calculate those things. I told you that 8.8 .8 terawatt hours per year is 1 gigawatt. So if you want to compare these two diagrams, you see that in the left plot in the year 2018, it says that 591 gigawatt have been installed and the right plot shows you also for the whole globe that 1250 terawatt hours per year have been produced. If you convert these terawatt hours into gigawatts as an average power, then you get 142 gigawatt. So what does it mean? It means that you have a certain amount of installed power, this 591 gigawatt, but on the average they produce only 152 gigawatt, which is natural because normally the wind is not blowing at the full speed. And in this case, it's about 24% of the full power which you get of the average, which is already quite good. It's also divided in the different continents. So you see, if you look at the year 2000, for example, it was mainly wind power produced in Europe. And only later than Asia and North America also put a lot of wind power stations. And today it goes up almost exponentially. So there's a big run on wind power. Because, as I said, this is one of the cheapest ways to produce electrical power nowadays. Compared to conventional power stations like fossil power stations, the biggest problem of wind power, of course, is its volatility. So it's fluctuating all the time. Sometimes there's a lot of wind, sometimes there's none. The amount of wind power depends not only on the position in geography on the planet, but of course also on time. And about that we have to talk when we talk about energy storage in one of the next lectures. But I want to show you one plot here, which is very important to my mind. This shows you as the blue curve, the amount of wind power, which is available in Germany on the average over the whole year. So there's a lot of wind in January and in December in winter, and there's a lot less wind power available in the summer. And in the contrary, the red curve shows the availability of solar power in Germany. And there you see in the winter, there is very little solar power and in summer there are the most sunny days and there's much more solar power available. These curves here are 24 years average and you nicely see that if you balance the amount of solar power and the amount of wind power in the right way and the total power is the black line which is the average of wind and solar power and there you see, if you look over the year, it's almost flat when you have the right fraction of solar and wind energy in your country. So this is very good news because that means that you need less long-term storage because there's some averaging out between wind and solar power between winter and summer. This is already the end of this lecture.
Next lecture, I want to continue to talk about wind power, but this time we talk a little bit more about the physics of wind power and the technology. And I hope to see you again. And this subject then is probably less emotional than the question if you really want to have wind power in your backyard or not. Thank you and see you next time. Thank you.